Uh, we're going to resume uh, with the next set of speakers in our panel. Uh, we're going to begin, uh, I'd like to call upon Crawford Allen. He is an international e expert on wildlife trafficking and trade uh, with 24 years experience in wildlife conservation policy and regulation. Currently working at the World Wildlife Fund. He was recently selected as part of the advisory council to the U.S. Presidential Task Force on Wildlife Trafficking. And we are very honored to have him here today in his capacity working particularly with the Coalition to End Wildlife Trafficking Online. So please welcome Crawford Allen. Okay, I think we're gonna need a bigger mic, okay. Um, so thank you so much to OES for the opportunity to be here today to talk to you about what we've already learned is about technology is that it is both a blessing and a curse uh, and, and no more so than when you were talking about wildlife trafficking online. Uh, next, Brad, please. Thanks. So, you know, we know very much about the global context of wildlife trafficking, how significant it is, how it's all linked to organized crime. And online trafficking is no different. And there's particularly, you'll see the emphasis of this slide here is, is really with live animals and exotic pets. We're seeing a major boom in exotic trade uh, in live animals online. And um, don't let that fool you, that cuddly image of, of a beautiful tiger cub. This is still linked to serious organized criminal activity. And these profits that are being made annually, these billions of dollars, are also very much now steeped in the way that it's all working online together. So um, next slide, please. The dynamics of the trafficking of wildlife um, globally is also being shifted and adapted uh, and linked to changes in the marketing online of wildlife. Trade routes are shifting. Of course, during the pandemic, we saw a decline in ivory trade and rhino horn to a degree and some recovery, although we're seeing uh, new worrisome trends in that too. But these dynamics are very much linked into some of the influence that law enforcement has had and investment, particularly by the US, to help boost law enforcement around the world has had positive impact on trafficking. It's, it's made it more difficult for traffickers. They've had to shift their routes. They've had to find new routes um, and new species and to adapt and, and move their, their goods around the world. There's been new transit hotspots emerging like Angola and Nigeria and Laos. Uh, some of the Middle Eastern countries have stepped up to try and combat it in the transit side. Um, you know, I think the, um, the opportunities we see here uh, is, is that we've got to keep on top of this and understand these dynamics if we're going to get um, proper solutions. And if, next slide, please. I think if you look at these examples, these are some of the typical things that any of us could find today by looking uh, on the web. And um, over a decade, we've seen that wildlife trafficking has shifted um, from these in-person sales in stores and marketplaces uh, to e-commerce sites. And now increasingly, social media is sort of the window shopping for illegal wildlife trade um, nowadays. You know, we used to spend a lot of our time monitoring the uh, backstreet markets of Asia. Everything was done through cash and physical presence. And now we've seen this new tangled web of, of private comments and closed groups and chats and, and electronic uh, payment processing uh, and these encrypted platforms. It's a whole different world in the way we have to tackle the problem. So you can, if you look online, you do research, you know, you'll start to see things where there are dozens of different aliases, but they're all linked to one burner phone number. So there's multiple profiles and personalities they're generating to try and circumvent detection. They're using code words. They're using just images. They're using emojis. Um, they're using these very short-lived uh, postings and listings that just disappear like that. So it is adapting. So you'll see here, obviously, you know, the typical things of elephant ivory, sea turtle leather, primates, and big cats are, are, are still very prevalent, unfortunately. You'll be hearing from uh, eBay shortly, who've done a great job of keeping ivory off their platform. And some of that, that has, has really been, been impacted heavily by many of the companies that we work with. That's been a bit of a success story. Um, you know, online platforms are, allow these traffickers this global reach. They can meet many buyers. Um, there's a lot less risk in how they work, right, in terms of working online in an with anonymity. Um, and much of the trade is now taking place in these encrypted chats. 
And of course, if you're a law enforcer and you're trying to hack into an encrypted chat, it's pretty impossible when the companies themselves that have created that platform can't hack into it themselves because of the encryption that they put in place for privacy reasons. Next slide, please. So we realize that these solutions, as we've heard already this morning, it's a multifaceted approach is needed. Cooperation, collaboration, public-private partnership. Um, and we figured out pretty quickly that online companies are really vital uh, as they have this potential to really impact a broad swathe of the listings, actually prevent them from being posted in the first place, to prevent illegal trade before uh, it even reaches the internet. Um, from within their systems and behind the scenes, they've got the opportunity to do that. Um, I think we've gone a bit far, Brad. Can you back up? There should be... Oh, there's a slide missing. I don't know what happened. Back up a bit. That, that'll do. We had a, a, lo a slide logos of all the logos of our companies here. And um, after years of building partnership with companies in 2018 with our partners I4 and Traffic as co-conveners of the Coalition to End Wildlife Trafficking Online, you would have seen a nice slide there with the title and 47 different logos of all the biggest companies in the world that have come together to work with us. Um, we launched in 2018 and I also want to thank OES who came with us to that launch as a counterpoint to the Chinese government that also came to the launch to show that there was government commitment and support for this initiative. Um, and we have many companies with us. We have Meta with platforms like Facebook and Instagram. We have Google with YouTube. Um, we have TikTok. We have Alibaba. We have Tencent. Um, many, many companies, 47 of them worldwide. Um, they're the leading ones. And we have a, a founding company with us today, which is eBay, who really have been I would say probably the best there is globally in terms of our, their response to wildlife trafficking from what we've experienced within our coalition. Um, we take this approach in the coalition. Um, this is representing what we do to support the companies. It is a, it is a, a company-focused approach. We work alongside them. We strengthen their, their prohibited content policies. Um, we help them with machine learning through provision of things like uh, keywords. We've got about 3,000 keywords we provide to the companies to help them with, with their filters. Um, we also help them in how they engage their billions of users to bring about education um, and, and systems to, to, to help report that to those companies. Um, but at the core of the coalition is about collaboration between the companies and learning and sharing, and that's something we're trying to do. And also, more importantly, we're now really focusing on how we can have synergies between the companies and law enforcement, because that has been a challenge in the past in this relationship between law enforcement and tech companies. So next slide, please. So, you know, there's never really been a baseline for monitoring the wildlife trafficking online. Um, we had to put in place some measures to see whether our coalition was working. And of course, um, one of the ways we do that is by measuring the number of listings and users that the companies remove. And I'm glad to report that between um, March of 2018 and September of 2023, 15.6 million listings and users were removed um, by the coalition companies. Um, it's, it's one of the metrics we can use. We do use other things, so we, we see how they're using the, the, the search terms we provide them. Are they applying those? Are they taking on board the learning and the training and the e-learning systems that we provide them with? Um, are their content mo um, moderators really know what they're doing? Um, and are they, are they really educating their users um, and having the right systems in place? Um, but if you have the next slide, you'll see there are some challenges here. And I think that's one of the things that's important. That it still remains that there's, there's some significant challenges. And the sector itself has been impacted. You know, there's been a lot of um, layoffs within the tech industry. Um, we've seen that there's no real regulation to, to really push the industry in a particular direction to combat wildlife trafficking online, which I think is significant. There's not really the levers there to make the, make the companies in the industry change and adapt to this point. Um, if you can back up there, thanks. Um, previous slide, please, Brad. So I think as more and more of these companies are rolling out these encryption to protect privacy, we're going to see that it's so easy for people just to deal with everything through encrypted messaging, from the sales part through to the shipping arrangements and the payment arrangements. Gathering of the data by law enforcement is going to be something we need to focus on for the future. Um, 
AI itself, artificial intelligence, we hear so much promise about that, but it holds problems in itself. And in fact, it can accidentally push the wrong content to people, and actually push illicit po posts out to people. And of course, um, the other is, thing is that you can really manipulate things using AI to be really quite confusing. It can really clutter the internet, particularly with spam and fake, fake um, listings, which there is a lot of them now. There's a lot of con men out there who are trying to sell uh, illegal trade. You'll hear from Fish and Wildlife, they might tell you about the fake traders in the, in the Central Africa, for example, offering chimpanzees that don't really exist. Um, so there's a lot of stuff with AI that can cause a problem. Next slide, please. So we have to, to also leverage technology as the solution. It really is, it is the answer, ultimately, is to keep ahead of the game, to make sure that our technology is better than the technology that the criminals are applying. And we have to be on, on top of it to understand really what they're doing and how they're evolving. So we have to scale these interventions. Um, and there are, there are many opportunities we've got with the coalition companies, because a lot of them have these things, the large language mo models that you've heard about, like ChatGPT. They also have imaging models as well, which can automate things much more effectively. Um, and they can train their auto detection systems now with a, a greater level of refinement uh, to, tr uh, to, to detect the trade that's occurring on their platforms. There's also a lot of the academia and NGOs are also working on various systems uh, to refine and scale. Um, to overcome the problem that we've seen so far, which is a lot of people are just doing manual monitoring online, which is very intensive, takes a lot of time. It's not timely enough for law enforcement response uh, when things get pulled down so quickly. So um, I think that the things like ChatGPT, Turbo, um, number four, I mean, they have capabilities now to really pull massive swathes of data off the line, they can start to understand why are people trafficking wildlife, what are the motivations, what are the trends, what are the changes, and do that in multiple languages that we're seeing online. Um, and they can also train models to auto detect things based on images as well, which is going to be something that is still remaining difficult, but I think it's going to be possible in the future. Many of the companies we work with also have automated tools of education to inform the users. So if you look for the wrong thing on Instagram, a pop-up will appear and say, you don't want to go there. Um, I think there's other things as well that you know they also can filter out things from search terms. So if you're searching for something, it won't let you search for rhino horn, for example. Um, we need to expand the, the, the information that we've got in terms of some of the key images, emojis, and search terms that are being used to help keeping those, those auto filters running. And of course, if people want to share information with us about that, we'd happily add those to the lists that are provided to these companies. Um, next slide, please. So I think an example, uh, one example of some of the, some, one development that WF's involved with is this one called the CyberSpotter AI model. Um, this is a WF Singapore project in partnership with AI Singapore, which is a government-led initiative. Um, they've been, for years, as we have, been using these volunteers called CyberSpotters who manually look for illegal trade online, and then you sift and filter it manually as well. It really is too uh, staff intensive to do that. So they're putting in place a system here that scrapes the web. Um, it uses AI to merge merge and look at the images that you see in, in, in listings and postings and the text. And it does an analysis that predicts how likely is that to be illegal. And it filters them and then it can provide it quickly and instantly to law enforcement to take action or to the companies to take that information down. Um, they're looking particularly at elephant ivory, pangolin scales and big cat products in Singapore, but obviously you could train this to, to do anything. Um, they're, they're finalizing a kind of a web interface for this that can be adapted and used by WWF, but obviously other NGOs, if they want to, we, we could get involved with that too. And they've got this, this web scraper that's automatically drawing illegal eagle ads from the internet and analyzing them. And I think as we will probably discuss here today, you know, tech is not a silver bullet, right? It's never going to be the ultimate solution. And, and hopefully we'll never see a time when people like we've seen like Nathan and his team working on the ground are not, no longer needed because their expertise and that insight in the human dimension is so important. But ultimately, I think tech holds a great deal of promise. We just have to try and avoid some of the pitfalls that, that we're, we're going to discuss today. Thank you.
Thank you, Crawford. Now I'd like to call up Tracy Andrighetti. She is coming to us as uh, Dr. Andrighetti is the Global Regulatory Specialist for eBay. Prior to joining eBay, she worked for Apple and on-site at Google, assisting Italian police with criminal investigations. She's currently focused on areas of uh, covert terms and methods used to list prohibited items, including illegally trafficked art and antiquities, as we heard from uh, Nathan before, as well as wildlife. Please welcome Dr. Ngay. Thanks, Whitney. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, everybody. I'm excited to be here today on behalf of eBay. Um, also, thanks to Crawford for the kind words. We definitely try, as I'm about to describe to everyone here. And thanks to Sarah at WWF, who always answers my emails. <laughs> they are many. Um, at the title of my presentation, as I thought about what to call it, um, Whitney had mentioned that we would be talking about AI today, and I will. However, for us, it's really just one piece. Um, and what we do involves so many different aspects, and I'm going to try to quickly walk you through them. Thanks. I don't know where. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the pangolin is the regulatory team's mascot, by the way. Um, so I started with a little bit of information about the eBay platform to give you an idea of our reach and also the scope of the problem when it comes to tackling um, a specific product or, in this case, the entire um, wildlife species, <laughs> which are many. Um, we have 132 million um, buyers, 190 plus markets, and right now there are a little over 2 billion listings on the site. Um, we're a partner with WWF, as you've heard, the International Fund for Animal Welfare Traffic, um, and through the Coalition to End Wildlife Trafficking Online, we do work with the broader tech community. Um, we're a gold partner also of the Wildlife Tra Trafficking Alliance. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, eBay does not allow endangered or threatened species on its site, um, and we did ban globally, I have the sale of ivory on the site as well. And last year we prohibited over 500,000 listings for um, wildlife items ranging from elephants to penguins to tigers. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So for us, it is a huge challenge to try to keep animal products off the site, as I'm sure you know. Um, I've given some of the, the things that have complicated the issue for us. Um, for one thing, I know right now there are over 16,000 endangered species alone. Um, the threatened species, there are tens of thousands. So for us, we have to know what we're looking for in many senses to be able to find it in two billion listings. Um, also, status of animals change. Um, I'm talking about in terms of protections, but as well as extinction, we had a case where WWF let us know that we had uh, something called Wallace's giant bee on the site, and it had been previously extinct, and then it was found, and unfortunately, one, um, a dead specimen was listed on the site. We, of course, promptly removed it. Um, another issue for us that's been mentioned, um, wildlife laws are inconsistent if they're there at all. Um, so it's made it hard for us in our different markets to manage the sale and what should be sold, what shouldn't. Um, I've already mentioned 2 billion listings. It makes it impossible to comb through our site on a daily basis looking for any one thing, much less whole categories of things. Um, and then um, 
we don't always know what we're looking for. So <laughs> I have a picture there of Victorian glove stretchers um, made of ivory and metal. These were reported to us by IFA. Um, I had never heard of glove stretchers being a thing in the Victorian era, but they were. Um, this is just one example of a seemingly infinite example of items that were made from ivory. So again, um, we search listings based on words, but also images now, as I'll, I'll talk to you about shortly. But again, if we don't know to look for it, um, we don't know it exists. It's very hard to find it. Um, and then the next point, animal products are sometimes hidden in plain sight. Um, I have a couple examples here. One is traditional Chinese medicine. That's the TCM. Um, I saw, for example, what looked like a bar of chocolate, but it's actually turtle plastron glue. So it literally looked like Hershey's chocolate. So just looking at the image, it's a chocolate bar. Um, you need to know what traditional Chinese medicine is and what it contains in order to be able to find it. So that's a big challenge. Um, also hidden in plain sight, we have something that I call cellar subterfuge. Um, so I was talking this morning with Lori and Whitney about a seller who uh, was listing deer antlers, but it's on a bearskin rug. Um, we have to decide and, and know to what extent that's intentional. Um, our assumption was that it is intentional, um, but that is a challenge. We've also had cases where someone is selling um, a lamp, say, but in the background there's a leopard skin rug. So what are they selling? Are they selling both, <laughs> one or the other? Um, that's, that's a big issue. Um, we have found, and believe this or not, that most sellers actually don't know what they're listing or they don't know it's prohibited. However, we do know there is a small percentage of sellers on the site that are intentionally selling illegally trafficked items. And I'm about to tell you what we try to do um, about that. Brad, next slide, please. Oh, first, it is a collaborative effort. We keep talking about collaboration today. Um, I personally, I'm on the regulatory team, as we've already mentioned, but I can tell you I personally work with over 10 teams at eBay all of the time. It's not just once in a while. It's daily in most cases. Um, I listed them here also to give them a shout out because a lot of these people work very hard. GCX is glo global customer experience. They're the people who are literally looking at the listings, taking them down. We have people on that team who are so passionate about animals, just they happen to be, that in their free time they go home and they search eBay sometimes in the evening just to see like what they can find and have it removed. Um, PRCI, prohibited, restricted, counterfeit items. Biz rules create block rules, uh, which I'll talk to you about. 3 p.m., um, there are AI people, uh, GR government relations, CRI, which is also important, criminal and regulatory investigations, authenticity guarantee, you know we sell luxury items now, so handbags, jewelry, things that are made from animal products, um, shipping, payments, et cetera. Um, we do routinely work with outside people and we get reports about wildlife products on the site from conservationists, regulators, wildlife crime agents, and the public. Here's some of the ways they report to us. If you're a regulator, we have a regulatory portal. You can report that item. It's automated. It's taken down. And then we have a team, PRCI who looks at what is taken down and takes note of it to see if we see any new trends, things we were unaware of previ previously, and then they work with biz rules to create block filters for these items, or in some cases, AI models. Um, the law enforcement e-request system, we regularly work with law enforcement. I will talk about that a little more shortly. And then on every single listing above the item number, if you scroll about halfway down a listing, there is a link 
to the words report this item, you report it, we take it down and we again monitor that to see what's being reported if we need to create block filters for those items. People also email me um, if they can spell my last name. Uh, my email is tandragetti at ebay.com. Andragetti likes spaghetti, Mario Andretti. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, we have what I call standard detection stuff that is really specific to anything on eBay. So we have no, just a seemingly infinite number uh -oh, of knowledge bases um, that we work on. In the case of wildlife, we work extensively. I gave Sarah a shout out because I asked her so many questions about animals for the knowledge base. Um, it's based on CITES as well, which has been mentioned. We revamped it last year in 2023 based on WWF's owlet training um, when it came time to work with 3PM to create the ivory model. I actually sat down and watched the owlet training and realized, okay, we need, to, we need to up our game. And so what we did was instead of listing in the knowledge base animals that are prohibited, we now have the animal, the species name, the various species, we have CITES status, we have uh, below that the uh, keywords commonly used to list the item, so beyond the species name, nicknames for the animal, um, secret covert terms, which I will talk about shortly, also types of common products made from the animal, because it's not enough to just know, oh, the tiger is trafficked, or the bear. You have to know why it's trafficked. Um, what are the parts? Is it just gallbladder? No. Um, bear paws, etc. claws, teeth. What are people looking for? Taxidermy bears. Um, and that way we can create blocks for that as well. Um, and then it also has common price points um, so that it raises suspicion. And th that helps us with things like, is this most likely to be a fake leopard coat or is this real leopard, right? If it's 90 bucks, fake leopard. If it's 1,000, 10,000, we know it's real. Um, the next thing we do, GCX does site sweeps. And we can pinpoint things we want them to look for if we're seeing an emerging trend, for example. But they do regular sweeps. The other thing, I've talked about block filters for suspicious keywords. Um, the way this generally works, there's another thing called a referral. So this is a very, um, a very general answer. But let's say you're trying to list elephant ivory. We have a block for that. We're not going to let you do it. But what if you just list elephant? and some other stuff, or just ivory, which we know is a color, and some other stuff. In that case, we might create what's known as a referral filter. It delays the listing for the amount of time we decide, 24 hours, 48 hours, to give a GCX agent time to look at it and see, is this something that should be there or not? Um, and then, let's see, mini comms and calibrations. Um, this is really just if we've noticed a new trend, uh, we've figured out a new animal needs to be prohibited, et cetera. We then communicate this to the GCX team and sort of the, the people who need to know at large. And then we do recalibrations every single month on products. Um, there was one recently that GCX did a calibration, these last an hour, we watched them on Zoom on ivory, and I was really, really impressed because if you know anything about elephant ivory, you know that it has cross-hatching marks, and um, they had discovered that if ivory is cut a certain way, it actually won't look like the cross-hatching pattern. It will look different, and they were, give, they were showing all these images of different ways that it could look depending on the way it's sliced. So that's the kind of thing that I mean by um, calibration. We also, the criminal and regulatory investigations team, um, we do something, we check for linked accounts. So if we find a seller like the one with the bearskin rug and the antlers, um, and we say we suspend that seller, we look later on to see, and also at that time of suspension to see, do they have other accounts and other names that they're using? Um, and then we check those accounts for the items. Um, next slide, please. 
This is some special stuff we've done for animals. I will try to pick this up. I realize I'm talking a lot. Um, the CRI team has um, something they call APE, Animal Protection Evaluation. So they do get regular reports from law enforcement. Um, they action those reports, and then they have a series of reports they run from the collective reports, looking for references to CITES, looking for references to the word species, et cetera. They take that information, and then they start searching the site for other people who might be doing the same thing um, the same way. GCX does something I like to call ivory a thons, um, and that was really their nickname, but I, I love the word. Um, and they spend a day just looking for covertly listed ivory. Um, and then we, in 2022, we did an ivory task force where we found 3,600 items listed globally using sort of covert terms. Um, we then actually took that information to inform our AI model, which I'll talk about. We did a really fun event. Um, I recommend this to any of the companies in the coalition. Again, there are 47 of us. Um, it, the WWF did a, a live training with our employees who were volunteering their time, so it wasn't part of their normal work day. And then for 24 hours, they tried to see how many animal products they could find. And then we reported everything we found to WWF. And I was super excited that um, eBay, according to Gia Grine, broke a WWF record for the most employees at a live training. So I'm very proud of that. Um, and the cool thing about that was I got thanks from um, employees around eBay who participated, who said it really reminded them that their job is important. It's not just a paycheck. And that was, I think, the best thing, <clears throat> excuse me, to come out of that. Um, shipping and authenticity guarantee. We have a hub in Japan that just opened up. You might have heard of it. Uh, things like everything from coral jewelry to handbags. Um, I worked with them to provide a list of every type of prohibited, prohibited animal skin, uh, corals, et cetera, um, even down to wood species, so that they can check the list before they ship an item overseas to the, to the US. Um, and then I talked about uh, traditional Chinese medicine, which we started looking at next year. And in the picture, um, that is a bear bile toothpaste, and I found that by searching those two Chinese characters, which mean bear bile. Um, and so you can see the bear gallbladder there on the bottom um, right. And then AI and machine learning, next slide. This is where I get into the AI stuff really quickly. We have two models that are in use. Um, they're new. They've been in development for about nine months, but they are now working. Um, the first one is based on an image repository that WWF very graciously gave us of 700 ivory listings. It predicts whether an item in an image is made from ivory-like material. Um, and so the wooden handle chisels, the model said, nope, that's not ivory-like material, but that pendant, the rose pendant below, it said yes, that is ivory-like material. Um, it does actually also look for the other ivories on the list, dugong, hippo, narwhal, orca, sperm whale, and walrus. Um, the idea is that it understands that those are ivories as well, and it will use that knowledge when it decides whether something is ivory-like or not. And then we have humans look at the results. The humans are the GCX team. <laughs> Feels weird to call them humans. Um, to see if it is accurate. For those items where the machine or the, the, it, the model has said it looks like ivory, um, but GCX is not sure because it doesn't see something obvious like Schrager lines or for walrus, the oatmeal-like center. Um, it then goes into the text classification model, which looks for text or keywords that might indicate ivory. And it looks for things like um, 
I've listed some words, but it, it's Victorian uh, carved and bone I've listed, but we have quite a list thanks to the coalition in part and thanks to our own research. It then also looks at the country of origin. Um, as we know, China and Japan have been producing item ivory items for centuries. And so it, it looks at whether or not the country might be a known place for ivory um, and then price points. And then GCX comes along, looks at the data, and makes a determination about whether that really is ivory and needs to be removed. Next slide, please. We have two ivory models in development, one that will tell us whether or not an item is actual elephant ivory. I don't know how well you can see the bracelet on the top, um, but it does have elephant uh, cross hatchings, the Schrager lines that I referenced, and below, that's actually faux ivory, that its nickname is French ivory, but it's celluloid. There are other types, arvorin, or Iv I don't know how to pronounce it, is one, um, and it's tricky for the model to distinguish between them because you can see that it has lines in it um, and people who make fake ivory trying to sell it as legitimate ivory because this happens a lot are getting better and better about mimicking Schrager lines um, and so there are also others though that just like celluloid that happen to have these lines and they're much more clearer to detect. And then finally we um, are experimenting with Google's um, multimodal large language model, language model Gemini, um, and what we found, it's, it basically is the same as our image detection model, but because it is a, uh, a different type of model, it's more likely to take in um, other aspects. It functions more like human perception, basically, and considers a range of things when it's making a decision and they have found that it matches our GCX verification in a little over 70 percent of cases. Next slide. And finally, um, before I get to the final slide, it's not all about ivory for us. We are working with an organization called Sea Turtles to incorporate their already existing seashell app, which you can download from um, the internet today, into our GCX tools. And basically, you take a picture on your phone, and when you go shopping, say you're in the Caribbean and you want to know, is this item that I'm buying that's called, they're calling it tortoiseshell, is it actual hawksbill turtle, or is it fake, is it resin, is it plastic? The app will tell you whether it's real or whether it's resin, plastic, something else. Um, we are finalizing this. We, the agreement is on, but it's taking a while to get it up and running, unfortunately. And finally, the last slide. Um, uh, Whitney asked me to talk about things that we tried that didn't work. And um, Mike Carson is who I report to on the regulatory team. He's the senior director of the North American regulatory team. He said it all worked until it didn't which is why you see the wide range of things that I just walked you through. Um, basically, people figure out how it works and they figure out ways around it, and so then we have to adapt. Um, AI is promising in this, but it's really only one weapon, as I've, I've told you about, and it's, in my opinion, it's not really um, ever going to be as good as people talking like we have done here today. We have to keep doing that. We have to keep learning about these animals, why they're trafficked, where they're trafficked from, sharing that information and innovating. And um, the theme of the day seems to be collaboration. It really is the key to keeping animals offline and in their natural environment. Thank you. In the interest of time, we'll just go ahead and um, start our uh, panel. But uh, to do that, I want to make sure that I do acknowledge uh, Lori Choquette who is the special agent in charge from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Office of Law Enforcement, uh, Wildlife Intelligence Unit. She's got uh, over 27 years with the federal government, including her years uh, in the Army as an Apache helicopter pilot. So she goes from uh, you know traveling around in helicopters to making sure that the bad guys online are doing uh, things. So it, I'll start questions with you. Um, 
can you tell us a little bit about how uh, your service is engaging to help stop this online trade and what are some uh, tools that would be of assistance to you as you collaborate with private partners? Sure, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so first I just want to kind of counter some of the, the large numbers that you heard from my counterparts on the panel. Um, they have very impressive things to tell you about how many millions of, you know, accounts they've blocked or taken off and, and kind of contrast that with small numbers for the organization that I represent. So I do work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Office of Law Enforcement. Um, and while Fish and Wildlife Service is a fairly medium-sized agency, the Office of Law Enforcement is a very small sliver of that agency with a global mission that you're all very aware of. Um, so just for numbers of contrast, our special agents in the field that actually conduct the investigations for wildlife crimes, we have a little bit over 200. Uh, when you take out management, it's if we have a solid 200 on the ground actually doing investigations, that's probably, that's probably a good estimate there. And then our wildlife inspectors are the boots on the ground at our ports of entry around the country. And they're responsible for both facilitating the the legal trade in wildlife and for interdicting and intercepting illegal wildlife trade. So they kind of have a dual role. Um, so that's what we have to work with as far as our capacity and resources to address this rampant wildlife trafficking that's happening globally. And technology is a part of all of our investigations, obviously, because I don't think any of us probably can name anybody that we know that doesn't utilize technology or social media or some kind of communications app in their everyday life. Um, so concurrently with that, that becomes a really good source of evidence and information when we're doing an investigation. Um, technology pro produces challenges and opportunities for law enforcement. The opportunities are the, the great abundance of information to help us get probable cause and evidence for our cases. The challenges also are the great abundance of that information because we don't organically have the technological solutions at our fingertips to cull through all of that data, distill it down to what is useful to us, and then figure out a way to best prioritize our finite resources to go after the, the most impactful activities that are occurring to protect the resources that we're, we're assigned to protect. So again, the C word of the day, collaboration, that's where it becomes very important for us to leverage our partnerships with our other government entities, non-government organizations, the public, and, and private sectors as well, because some of those entities have a larger capacity to create the technology uh, and keep up with the times. Um, law enforcement inherently, historically at least, has been a very reactive type of a profession. We have to sort of wait for the activity to happen. And usually the activity, unless it's super egregious and, and public, has to happen a number of times before we kind of catch on. We're not dumb, it just takes us a second. So um, we're always playing a game of catch up. And with te technology, the tools that are available, that we're showing that are available to sort of intervene and try to prevent wildlife trafficking, those tools are evolving on a daily basis and they're also available for all the people out there trying to take advantage to use them for the opposite. So. We're already in a game of catch up as a law enforcement, as, as law enforcement in general, but now we have to try to, to, to run behind this, this locomotive of technology and keep up with it. And, and collaborating with partners, becoming partners, and fostering those relationships is how we're going to best do that so we can have uh, a better focus on the priority, the priority targets for our investigations. Thank you. Um, Crawford, I uh, wanted to ask. Um, you, as we think about this, how are you, um, with the coalition, working uh, not only with uh, industries but other NGO partners and, to some extent, also government entities to help uh, share data and share best practices and, and improve the mechanisms to interdict um, and prevent a lot of the trafficking that we do see online? Yeah, there is a there is a great community of people we work with around the world that that also pass information to us that we also help filter and pass through to the companies themselves, and of course we we have a responsibility where we see something that 
it's not just your average run-of-the-mill one-off sort of illicit ad that might just be you know somebody selling grandma's earrings it's actually linked to what we believe is potentially organized criminal activity, then we have an obligation to share that with the respective law enforcement agency internationally. And because of the role of, of, of Fish and Wildlife Service and its footprint globally, we can also share that with the, with the local um, attaches around the world too when we find that information. But you know, we work in partnership obviously directly with Traffic and I4, but there are other organizations too, and we also help um, pass their information through to the right people at the companies because it's very hard to figure out who you share that information with for an NGO and get it to the right person at the right time in a quick way. Um, we have increasingly been, been bringing law enforcement to the table in private one-on-one -on -one meetings with companies to try and figure out a way to get around some of the concerns that companies have about protecting the privacy of their users with the needs for law enforcement to take enforcement action. So we've been bringing them to dialogue one by one to the table to understand ways in which they can collaborate and share information. It is a delicate dance, right, the way that these things work. And, and currently, this, one of the main tools that, say, Fish and Wildlife have is to um, try and get information formally from companies. They need the power to be able to get a subpoena to be able to get that information from the companies. But it would be better if there was a collaborative mechanism. We're trying to work on that. I think one of the things that, that we've got to get towards, which is to answer one of the points that was mentioned by Laurie, is that these so-called large language models, the modeling systems at the moment, yes, they're great at potentially pulling out what could be illegal listings, but we've got to go beyond that to draw out the essence of what is organized crime, what is serious, what is connected, and do the network analysis that links to that filtering to be able to provide very rapidly packages of intelligence to law enforcement. And I think Ultimately, there should be a way that companies and law enforcement can work together on that with civil society groups. But we're just not there yet, I think, in terms of the technology and that kind of cooperation that we have talked about to get that to work. And, and that was something that we heard from the, the Fish and Wildlife Service colleague earlier, the question about protection of human rights and protection of making sure that certain privacy is maintained when appropriate. Um, and it was interesting to note that, um, Tracy, eBay has two places. One is like flagging for this might be uh, a concern, which you address, but then also a separate law enforcement button. What kind of drove that decision to make a distinction? Because you also gave the example of uh, searching online and then reporting to WWF, not to law enforcement. So what kind of drives those distinctions for you? The distinction between when you should use which portal. Yes. Um, so the regulatory portal is for regulatory bodies, and the law enforcement portal is for law enforcement agencies. But that, of course, includes wildlife crime units, um, et cetera. And then that report an item feature is just really for anybody who's looking at a listing. You can report it if you know, like, this shouldn't be on the site for one reason or another. Um, but the law enforcement request system beyond wildlife, it's used for any type of crime, obviously, that's taking place on eBay. And so we do have the criminal and regulatory investigations branch of, of kind of my team, we're related, um, that handles those requests and, like I said, pours through them. So it was important, it, it was and is important to eBay to have a place to dialogue, basically, with law enforcement on these issues. And so that is what the accessing user will see is just report button, but internally you have the means to then make the distinction of yes. this is a regulatory yeah. question or it's a law enforcement question. The reg they are two separate portals. Okay. So um, and and we we encourage people to sign up. So if you're a regulator, I you can let me know and I can get you signed up. And then what you report as a regulator is automatically removed. And as I said, people are reviewing those things to determine what's going on on the site and if we need to create those block filters, et cetera, that I discussed. Um, law enforcement, that's we are assisting them um, with crime, criminal investigations, typically. So that is separate. OK. And, and Lori, I'll go back to you. The, what is the, from your side, give, we talked about scale. You just mentioned the, the numbers, and we, we talked about that earlier. Um, I heard had someone tell me not long ago that perhaps 12,000 conservation-focused enforcement agents in the entire United States. 
um, if I count state and tribal and federal, uh, that's not very many for a kind of big place. And then the numbers from, as we heard from Peter earlier, in other countries are even worse. Um, what, what would you look for um, turning to some of these partners, the organizations or the companies to help you in your work, given that they have, as you mentioned, money and people to address some of these problems? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry about that. Um, early, co early collaboration would be great, and, and I failed to mention in, in my opening remarks that my unit is a great first step as far as trying to reach out to the Office of Law Enforcement for Fish and Wildlife Service because the intelligence unit is kind of uh, the best position to receive information that maybe if you don't know where to direct it, we can direct it to the appropriate party in the right region to to you know, do the investigation. Um, and I also have some folks on my team that are the, the points of contact for OLE with Interpol and Europol. So we would be the natural first step um, when you're not sure where to go to impart that information. Um, some of the things that could help us, just based on what I've heard today and um, from our, our colleagues in the previous panel as well, is these this dictionary of terms, uh, emojis, and different languages would be very helpful for us. We encounter them in the course of our investigations, but I don't know that they're widely shared amongst everybody, so you kind of end up just hoarding that knowledge that you got from your own personal experience, but, but maybe somebody that's in the next state over doesn't have that same experience because they've done a different type of investigation. So to be able to have sort of a condensed, consolidated list with some of the terms we may not know are now being used to sort of covertly refer to something else um, would be one way for us to help us. Um, we do use legal process to get evidence from, from social media platforms, um, but oftentimes they'll be in a foreign language, which again requires more resources that we may or may not have available, or it may just be very time consuming for us to figure out if there's anything useful or not useful in that, especially if, if you're saying, looking at like a Facebook return, if it's tens of thousands of pages long and it's in Chinese, well, how do we figure out how much of that we need to translate to see if there's anything relevant there? Well, having some of those, those terms would be helpful for us to just kind of do a search that way. Um, Another aspect that I would mention um, is while, while blocking and removing accounts and posts are, are a great way to keep that from happening on, on a platform, um, it may be useful sometimes to, to interact with law enforcement to ensure they're not un, unmeaningly, you know, unwittingly shutting down an investigation that we have going. Because of the challenges with technology, if we're following somebody, um, during the course of an investigation, we rely on those interactions online to basically build up our evidence for our cases. So if we're following somebody and we finally figured out what platform, what username, whatever it is that they're using online and it gets shut down and now they create a new username, a new account somewhere else, we've just lost the trail and it's really difficult to pick it back up. So um, sort of like techniques and things like that could be useful to help. Okay. I mean, this, again, we, we talk about our, the limitations, and, but, and this is a place, however, where uh, that challenge and opportunity exists. There's a lot of information out there, but a good machine learning model that was able to scrub through the 10,000 pages in uh, Mandarin would, if you had it, the right tool to be able to address it, would help a lot. Um, again, I want to give an opportunity, mindful of the time, uh, if there are any questions. Uh, either online or from the audience, if anybody wants to take a moment or have a thought. Uh, I also, uh, just thinking about sort of next steps, you, um, eBay has developed this model um, and it's working towards uh, trying to stop this trade. I, I like the distinction you made, Crawford, about somebody selling grandma's earrings versus somebody who's doing an organized network. It's, how, how are you sort of trying to make the distinctions between the person who inadvertently shows something that um, is outside the bounds of what is lawful in the United States or internationally versus this is a pattern and that's a problem and now it's, now it's their turn to engage as opposed to you just don't know what you're doing. <laughs> 
Um, for eBay, that's actually pretty easy for us. So we can not only see the history of everything you've sold as a seller, um, but as I mentioned, we look for those linked accounts. And typically, if someone is selling something prohibited, uh, they, they tend to have more than one account in the event that if one is taken down, the others are still operational, and they don't lose that business that they've built up with whoever their clients are. Um, and so we can track all of that. We can see what you're doing, what you're selling, what you've sold. Um, one thing that would be helpful for us, I know um, in the area of art and antiquities, the Art Intelligence Unit of the US military created a known list of red flag names for those who were involved in um, the looting of Nazi looted art, et cetera, but just stolen and looted art during the war. And it would be very helpful for us to have names of known traffickers. Um, that's something we could use. But yeah, in terms of um, us tracking a seller, that's we can do that. So again, where you hear the example that we keep hearing, collaboration is the key. Yes. Have a uh, questions? I have a quick question. All right. Um, you showed, yeah. Hi, thanks. Uh, you showed the picture earlier of the adorable cheetah cub that was for sale. And so let's say that there is, that, that I know it would never be on eBay, but let's say it's on eBay, then it is taken down, as Lori noted, even though that person's being trafficked. How, do you have examples of like sort of following that item and trying to figure out what the, um, keywords or emojis or whatever to, to, to actually intercept that trafficking in, in, in real time as it moves along platform to platform. Thank you. <laughs> well, I don't know if I've got all the answers on that, but you know, so the, the issue that the way we work is, is you know, we do um, we do that. We do that. I mean, and our partner organisations do that. Traffic as well as as I for they do the analysis on when we find things that look like they're not a scam. They look like they're serious and organised. The other model we have is just a disruption model. Is we just try and disrupt illegal activity. But when we find things that we think could really be a serious case, then obviously we will then look into that, and there will be analysis done. Um, to look at what those trends are. And, and my colleague here, Sarah, in the room is working a lot on that with just looking and understanding how these trends are shifting and, and, you know, and see how it moves along. I think one thing that's important to note is that even if somebody does take stuff down, it's not lost. The companies still have their archives and all the backup data and they can look at how things were, were done and if it's a pro payment that's done through their platform they, they can see all the, follow the financial money but yeah things are, are sometimes lost it's very difficult to determine what really is organized that we should tell law enforcement and what is just something that's not and you know when we talk to law enforcement they say well we can't deal with three million listings a year we can't analyze that just give us the cherry pick the really serious stuff. And of course, we try to do that, and we try and do that and follow it wherever possible. But um, our priority has been to disrupt the trade, which is to prevent the listings in the first place. Don't even get them out there so people can buy them and we miss, them, we miss it. And then to disrupt it and have them taken down to just, if you think about eBay, they've got two billion auction listings at any one point in time on the planet. How can law enforcement filter through two billion listings to find the essence of what's illegal? It's a, that's just one platform, right? And that's just eBay. If you think about all the other platforms on the planet, it is a massive and daunting task. So I think everybody's trying to do what they can. I think technology will be a solution. And we're going to make mistakes, right? We still make mistakes, but we've got to just try and do what we can to disrupt initially and then try and help with prosecution and get to the to organized crime groups. But it's, it's never a perfect science at the moment. All right, we, we have two questions, I believe. I'm going to have actually ask both people to ask both questions, and then we'll try and address them collectively because we are over time. Yeah, uh, thank you. It's good to know like what eBay is doing in uh, uh, helping the law enforcement agencies. But from the law enforcement point of view, I think two, two things are very important. One is the following the individual, and the second thing is the following the money transaction. So what I can understand, you may help the law enforcement with the IP address and like the other 
uh, like the email and other stuff with the, to identify the individual. But what do you do uh, to track the money transaction? Okay, well, let's go ahead and get this second question and see. Thank you. Um, and this question kind of builds off of the previous question in terms of not just tracking the money transaction, but I'm very curious, especially um, to hear from eBay about um, how the buyer is tracked or you know what kind of knowledge there is about um, folks who are, who are buying these animals in um, the market here. Yeah, that's certainly a concern we talk about is the demand side as well as the supply side. Um, in terms of the first question, we have a payments team that tracks and follows money. Um, and I don't work closely with them. However, I know that um, that's actually why I brought up the point of if we knew trafficker names, um, we can certainly look for any accounts they have, linked accounts, um, but also report them to the payments team and they handle the money transactions. So I'm sorry I can't be more specific, but it's just that I don't typically work with them on what they do with the knowledge after they get it, if that makes sense. Um, in terms of the buyer, do we track a buyer? I think that was the question. Uh, or just how do you, what, what do you do regarding buyers? I would say more generally, you know, to what extent are we able to try and influence where the demand is? Um, that's been a little bit more challenging, I think, in terms of handling buyers. If, if you're asking, do we track them specifically, no, but if there is criminal activity involved, that is certainly reported and handled through the criminal and regulatory investigations team with law enforcement. Um, we have tried to educate buyers. We do try to educate buyers. That's part of the um, World Life Trafficking Alliance I spoke about. We do annual charity auctions, things like that, um, animal-related things like trips to a zoo or like paintings by an elephant. That's that has happened, um, and try to we we have blog posts things we write about animals we do things around certain animal days like this event world wildlife day broader wildlife obviously um and i'm trying to think what i i think i've said this before um this might seem like a small thing but it's not when somebody tries to list something that they shouldn't be listing they do get those block filters i spoke of they do get a message from us telling us, you know, it looks like you're trying to list this item, which is prohibited. Um, here's why. And if you have any questions about that, refer to our animal products policy. So even in small ways, like blog messages, we're trying to educate buyers about what shouldn't be out there. But that really is, I think, the biggest challenge facing all of us is how we drive down the demand for things like products made from animals, which I have to say is really strange to me. I don't understand the appeal that that's just my personal feeling, but um, I do think faux leopard print is a lot more exciting than real leopard print, I guess, <laughs> as a buyer, but that is the challenge. And I really have to um, give a shout out to those brands that are working really hard to try to make things like faux fur and faux leopard print fun and sexy and exciting, um, because that really is what it's about. It's demand. Like, why do people want it? How can we stop them from wanting it and make them want the fake alternative? So just to give, uh, in mindful of the time, I want to give the last word to Lori to talk about what would you like the audience in the room, online, um, to understand, know and understand and help us do more to stop wildlife trafficking. Okay, okay. well, so with that, I'm gonna address some of the questions and, and some of the things that, that Tracy's brought up. The, the education across the, the, the companies that are, have a, a major online presence is, is a key portion, um, and, it, and it's useful to law enforcement as long as it's in a place where they can't just avoid it, which it sounds like, you know, for eBay's, it, it's going to pop up in your face if you're trying to do something that is prohibited, and here's why. That's awesome, because later on down the line, if that person continues to do that, they can't claim they don't know anymore, and there are some portions of some of our laws that require an intent portion, uh, an element be uh, proven. And while that not in and of itself having that banner pop up at you isn't necessarily proof, but it, it does go to kind of create 
here's the, here's the foundation for this person, can't claim they didn't know. Um, so that, that is something I wanted to acknowledge as being very useful for law enforcement purposes once it gets to that point. Regarding the question about uh, financial transactions, um, so my unit, um, it's, that's a major component of what my unit does anytime it's, it's building out information in support of any of the investigations that we're running. Generally, you know, there's, there's a couple of items that kind of cross the boundaries of any kind of uh, criminal enterprise um, that, are, that provide really good, useful evidence for what is going on in communications between the parties that are networking together, the financial transactions, and then some of their movements globally, tra uh, travel and things like that are some really useful ways to link them and kind of build out the network and figure out. You may only have one target you're looking at, but when you start looking at finances and communications and where that person travels, it, it helps build out who else they're working with. We do have partnerships with other government entities and we have some commercial, commercially purchase platforms that help us look into those arenas and kind of follow the money, which also helps contribute to better uh, prosecutorial outcomes because sometimes those types of things, wire fraud or money laundering, those types of crimes are a little bit easier to prosecute. They're, they're cleaner for some people and they, and they have better, better penalties. Um, so that is always a, a huge aspect of any of the wildlife crime investigations that we run because it, it just helps us get a better outcome. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to the, this panel. Thanks to the previous panel. Thank you to all of you who have come here today in person and who have joined us online. We hope this has been a useful uh, discussion and uh, that you have made some connections today and will make some connections from this for the future to help all of us do more to stop wildlife trafficking online uh, and out in the world. We saw so many examples uh, in the foyer from our Fish and Wildlife Service colleagues of what that looks like um, and the pictures uh, that the children painted to give us a, a sense of what we will lose if we do not do more to stop this. Uh, that said, the conversations give me hope that we are uh, moving increasingly in the right directions and technology can help us make some improvements going forward. So thank you very much. I wish you all a wonderful World Wildlife Day, officially on Sunday, but thank you for coming to join us today. <laughs>